Hello, I'm Alan Lee. Welcome to this week's programme of Endzone Focus. The 10th of April 1968 is not a date in this country's history that we're likely to forget. On that day, the remains of Cyclone Giselle hit Wellington at the same time as another storm had roared up the west coast of the South Island from Antarctica. The result was a storm that had winds of 160 kilometres an hour and a huge swell to go with it. The night before it hit, the vehicle ferry Wahine had set off from Littleton on its way to Wellington, and the rest, as they say, is history. We've seen the pictures, we've watched the footage, and we've heard some of the stories, but we've not heard all of the stories. Two Salvation Army workers in Wellington, Joan and Gilbert Beale, found themselves in the midst of the frantic rescue effort on the rocky Eastbourne side of the harbour, while most of the emergency services were on the Seatoon side of the harbour. Their work that day, and in the days that followed at Hutt Hospital, has been largely overlooked. But their story is one that sums up the famous Kiwi can-do spirit and the dedication of the Salvation Army, the Bible with skin on, as somebody once said. I went to Christchurch to meet Joan. The storm which has been battering Wellington City since early this morning may be the severest ever recorded in the area. Wellington Airport is closed and many of the capital's roads are blocked by floodwater, fallen trees and slips. There's been widespread damage reported in residential areas and many services have been cut. Sections of roofing iron have been torn away in the storm. And here's a special news item just to hand. The inter-island ferry Wahine is reported to have gone aground on Barrett Reef a short time ago. Tugs are on their way to help, but the Marine Department believes there is no serious danger. We had the wireless on, and the news kept coming through, and we were listening for it. And um, Gilbert, my husband, he was working in the office which was attached to the house, and I was out doing just household tasks, you know, until suddenly he came out and said, the, the, the ship's is tipping and the people are told to abandon ship um, this is going to be bad the tides will he knew the Wellington Harbour and he said the tides will take a lot of these people come on we've got to get cracking so he just filled up his the urns he had with tea and said it's hot drinks when they come in cold because nobody foresaw what really eventuated in that situation <laughs> It's now half past one and the wahine has swung round broadside to the wind. It's got a lift of about 30 degrees which appears to increase as time passes. The wahine is rolling frightfully in the heavy swell in the harbour. It lift increases and then it's... So our son, and, and 17, our daughter 14, said we'll come and help you dad and he thought they would be just handling, handing out cups of tea. And then when they left the car at the parking area, they had a long way to walk around the rocks before they came to the place where the people were being swept in. And then it was too late to get out, and they realised what was happening. There were dead bods, bodies around, and people who were gashed, badly gashed, and it was too late to get the child out, the girl out, but Stanley, the son, he got involved with a lot of the work round about. And um, he just told our daughter to stay close to him. And they did what they could. And then he gathered her up and brought her home. And she was well shaken, but it did her no harm. She grew up overnight, that girl. She grew up overnight. And so then he went straight to the hospital to warn the doctors what was happening and there would be ambulances coming in and uh, how many people? They knew not how many people would, would finish in the thing. In reality, the official rescue effort was delayed by several hours because the authorities were uncertain over the ship's fate. Those on shore didn't realise at first the gravity of the Wahine situation and emergency services were already rushed off their feet as the storm wreaked havoc around the capital. Joan and Gilbert Beale found themselves not just supporting, but organising the rescue operation. There was a Church of Christ minister, and they worked together on that first night, getting them all into hospital. They worked together all night, mm -hmm. you know. 
So apart from that, we just picked up the emergency and ran with it. Did what we could, you know. The doctors allotted two wards that were empty and waiting to be put into a new project at the hospital. They called in the staff and the doctors, set up the beds, went to work. And at that stage, I was at home and with Joanne that night, I slept with her in my arms because she was so upset. I just slept with her in my arms all night in bed until seven o'clock in the morning. And about seven o'clock, Gilbert came in and said, come on, we need you at the hospital quick. And he went and picked up his mother, who lived close by, to come and look after our family. And I got into my uniform and ready, and way up we went. And all of these people were then coming out of their sedation. I've never heard anything like it, with the screams and the yells, the groans of pain from some, the sobbing from all of them. And it was, it was really heartbreaking. But however, I sent, I got on the phone and I rang our training college and said, send me a, send me a van full of cadets. This training will be good for them. Send me some of them. And so they sent me a van full of the, the young trainees. I said, right, now you go from bed to bed and you listen. They've got to get out their story. You listen to their stories. You comfort them where you can and then move on to another one. That's your task this morning. And the doctors then told us that they had decided the only way they were going to cope with it, because there were so many, was to get these folk home as quickly as possible to wherever they were going. And then doctors in the ta various towns could cope with two or three. So they had to be got ready. My job was to get them ready for the road. Now, they had no clothes. Some of them had very little on. The, the water had ripped their clothes off them. They were sopping wet and in rags and tatters. So they'd been put into a hospital gown, and that's all they had. So Gilbert went shot down to Hannah's shoe store <laughs> and said, can you give me a quantity of soft various sizes of soft slippers because if they'd walked the rocks and all the water their feet were swollen often cut and very very painful um, and then he went to the men's and women's outfitters and he said i want a quantity of men's singlets and underpants in various sizes and the ladies singlets and panties in various sizes as many as you can and he came back with all of this. The hospital gave me another room to set up with the clothing alongside of the, the wards. And um, then he went down to our thrift shop and gathered up all the warm clothes that were hanging on the shelves there, emptied the shop out and put them all up, all sizes, all kinds. And uh, so then the receptionists at the hospital uh, found out what time the different ones were going to be there for, for their folk. And so we began one at a time to go through and clothe them ready for their journey. One funny thing that happened was that you got a very warm reception when you went into the, the wards. Oh, I'd never, oh, no, I'd never had this, the, the red carpet treatment <laughs> in my life before. Um, and I'd visited the hospital many times and that kind of thing, you know. Um, but this day, as soon as I entered a ward, knowing that there were people who'd come through surgery in that ward, because only the surgical patients were in other wards, and I'd go to the ward to see what was happening. And immediately there'd be a sister and a nurse at my side. Um, what can I do? What can I do? What can we do to help you? And I said, oh, heavens. What's going on around this place? I've never been treated like this before. <laughs> However, my husband came in and I said to him, I don't know what's, what's going on around this place. And he said, haven't you read the notice on the notice board in every ward on this hospital? 
I said, I haven't got time to stop reading notices. I said, I got far too much to do without stopping to read any notice. That's their business. And he said, well, just stop and read it sometime. The notice said, when Mrs. Beale comes into your ward, you give her your full attention. <laughs> Boy, I had the full attention, all right. <laughs> but it was very helpful. They were marvellous at that hospital. They really were. They were marvellous. And they gave to us absolutely every attention and helped us to do a job that was done on the spot without any preparation for it, you know. Mm. But then on Monday, Easter Monday, uh, a friend of ours was the man in charge of Beacon Hill that was the signal station for the ships. And he told us to come up and have a look. And we went up and we looked down on the ship. Here was the sea as calm as a mill pond. The tide was out and a child could have paddled out to that boat. No. And I looked at the great width of the Wellington Harbour. Beautiful harbour, but so wide. And to think that so many people had been rushed off like that, swept away with these ferocious seas, and all that damage was done. Welcome back, and let's rejoin Joan Beale's story about how she and her husband helped survivors of the Wahine tragedy. You can get the coffee cups out of here. Nearly 50 years after the Wahine disaster, Gil and Joan Beale are now living in Christchurch. Their daughter Joanne also now works for the Salvation Army in Wellington. Son Stanley lives nearby. They may seem unlikely heroes, but to dozens of families around New Zealand, they are heroes indeed. Gil and Joan were on the spot, helping people who had literally nothing left. In an emergency like that, you do what you can when you see what, what is necessary. You grab what you can and do what you can. One gentleman um, kept saying to me, sister, sister. So I went away over to him. He said, you know, and then he told me his story. He said he was about to jump into the sea when he saw a lady standing, ready to jump, she had a baby in arms and a little boy of three, about th around about three, two or three. And he suddenly thought, she's not going to manage those two. So he said to her, look, give me the little boy and you look after the baby. So he jumped with the little boy, she jumped with the baby. And the little boy, because he was a grey-headed older man, kept saying, Grandad, you won't let me go, will you? Don't let me go, Grandad, don't let me go. So he hung on tight with this little boy. And he said, I fought the waves for this little boy's sake until we got over the other side. And he said, once we hit the shore, I collapsed. I didn't remember another thing. But I thought the boy was all right, but I didn't know. Could you find the boy for me? Could you find out whether he made it and whether the mother and the baby made it? Well, we had no names of who they were. He didn't know who they were. So I said to Gilbert, because he was in and out to the centre in town as well as Eastbourne and the hospital, and he said, uh, yes, I'm going in there. So he went in and he found the mother with the baby and the little boy had been taken in and... Uh, reunited with his mother. So when he came back, I went back to the elderly gentleman. I said, look, it's OK. They are re re reunited as a family and all is well. With tears streaming down his face, he said to me, you know, that little boy will always think that I saved his life, but I didn't. I didn't. He saved mine. He said, I could never have struggled with those waves. They were too big. They were... But a little boy who's calling out, Grandad, don't let me go, I kept at it for him. Otherwise, I'd have given in. He saved my life. 
I remember one, one lady, her feet were badly swollen and they were very painful. Um, they, I couldn't get a pair of slippers to fit her and the hospital said her feet are too sore to bind them up. What am I going to do? I saw a nurse coming towards me with two hot water bottles. So I said to her, excuse me, my dear, but could you give me those two hot water bottle covers? Yes, she gave them to me. Thank you very much. So I went in and I slipped them on her feet and tied them around her ankles. <laughs> and I said, well, my dear, that is that is protection. That's the best we can do. At least it will keep your feet warm and at least it's protection for your feet. And she was on her way to the wire wrapper, so she needed mm -hmm. some protection. And then there was a man, another man, who said, said to girl, you know, he said, my wife died, and so I sold up in Christchurch, and I was just on my way up to live with my daughter. And all the money I possessed was in a wad of notes in my pocket, in my sports, in my jacket. And that's all I possessed to start a new life. He said, I haven't got a coat now and the money's all gone. I don't know what I'm going to do. So Gil just took off through the hospital, down into the laundry, <laughs> down into their big drying room. And here was a heap of wet, wringing wet clothes. And he tossed his way through them and he came across this man's jacket. And sure enough, here was a wad of notes in the pocket, sopping wet. So <laughs> on his way out, he took them into his mother at the house and he laid them all out on baking sheets <laughs> and put them in the oven and put the oven on very, very low. And the man had told him exactly how much was in that wad of money. I don't, I don't know because this was his story and um, he doesn't remember. But uh, later in the day he went back and they'd all dried out and he counted them and they were the exact amount that this man had told him. So he went back to him and gave him the money that he'd lost. No jacket, but we dressed him anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know your husband was, was very involved in, in getting people home after they were released from, from hospital, but it wasn't just a case of of putting them on the bus. No, no. Um, it came Sunday, no, Friday, Good Friday. And in the Salvation Army, we have services on Good Friday. And, uh, and I was one of the speakers uh, for the Sunday afternoon. And I was sitting on the platform and by this time all the folk at the hospital had gone home and we'd cleaned everything up. And um, so Friday hit. But of course there were still a lot of people in the Wellington centres that were being sent out. And uh, so I was just about to step up to speak when one of the bandsmen and the band at the back of me tapped me on the shoulder and said, there's a message for you, Mrs Beale. Your husband has just left for Wanganui with a very sick man in his car to deliver him to his people. Thank you. My only thought was, good grief. That man hasn't seen any sleep for 48 hours and he's driving this man to Wanganui all those long roads up to Wanganui. Dear Lord, just take care of him. Don't let him go to sleep was all I could say. Don't let him go to sleep on the road. And I stepped up and delivered the message that God had given to me. And he gave it to me. He knows what he's doing. He gave it to me early enough that it was well prepared before this thing hit. And that to me was well He's always a step ahead, a jump ahead of us, you know, and he's got the preparation there. So then I found out that a younger officer who was our youth officer in, in uh, Wellington, and he knew that my husband had no sleep for 
two nights. So he said to him, Gilbert, I'm coming with you to help with the driving. So when I knew that Alvin was with them, I knew that it would be all right. 51 people died that day in Wellington Harbour and in the terrible conditions, it's a miracle that there weren't more deaths. There were 733 passengers and crew aboard the Wahine when it was forced onto the reef. Only four standard lifeboats could be launched and one of those was swamped as it was lowered into the sea. Some people tried to make their own way ashore, others reached inflatable life rafts, but some of those had been punctured by wreckage. A subsequent court of inquiry found that more lives would almost certainly have been lost if the order to abandon ship had been given earlier or later. Another family which played a big part in our lives too at that time, they were on a tour from overseas of New Zealand. Parents, mother and father, and I can't remember whether it was two or three girls. I think it was two the father was with us at the hospital in Lower Hutt and he had no idea what had happened to his wife and his girls. And so Gilbert took him in, in the car into Wellington Centre and the two girls were there looking for their parents and couldn't find them. So there was Dad but couldn't find Mum. And so Gilbert took him accompanied him into the morgue to look for his wife. And yes, he found her there, but the only way he recognised her was by the rings on her finger. Forty years after the disaster in 2008, a memorial park was opened on the waterfront in Wellington Harbour. Beneath the salvaged main mast of the Wahine, survivors paid tribute to the many unsung heroes of that dreadful day, the men, women and children who risked their own well-being to save the lives of strangers. The plaque's dedicated to all those who assisted in the rescue effort. It says simply, you saved us from disaster and took us to a safe place. Thank you, the survivors. What about you yourselves? Because I mean, you'd been through a terrible time. You know, your your, your children had had seen seen terrible things, and, and and you too had had been seeing awful things as well. How how do you cope with the trauma? Well, God is good always, always, and uh, He gathers. If you're doing a job for Him like that. He gathers you up too, you know, and grace is given, strength is given for the minute, for the time, and inspiration along the way as to how to handle this and how to get on with it and how to, you know, and if you're representing him and helping people and loving people through this kind of thing, you don't suffer by that. I was talking there with Salvation Army officer Joan Beale, and as she mentioned during that interview, many people who were rescued from the Wahine disaster were in dire need of the most basic essentials. Many had been stripped of their clothing and their footwear by the huge waves, and they also had severely lacerated feet from being washed onto the sharp rocks by the storm. As we chatted with Joan after filming that interview, she asked us to pass on her special thanks to the many business people who provided personal clothing for those survivors. The stores were quick to contribute what was needed and they did so free of charge, as Joan found out when she went back to those stores to settle up what was owed. She was very grateful to you then for your generous support and she's still very grateful to you today. So on her behalf, thank you. And that's our programme for this week. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Kakite, God bless you.